uh, Skillet has been amazingly successful. I mean, that's, that's awesome on its own, John, and welcome to this conversation, by the way. Um, some of the stats that I just got to share are that you've sold over 12 million albums. That's amazing. And over 800 uh, million views on Skillet's YouTube channel. And then this one is so impressive. I almost want to do the Dr. Evil uh, sign. <laughs> over 2 billion, 2 billion with a B streams of your music on Pandora. That's absolutely incredible. It's hard to believe that once upon a time, Skillet was a worship <laughs> in a church in, in Memphis. And, uh, and probably just as hard to imagine back then that you would be at this place in your career now. Is it fair to say say that you have been leading worship for more than half of your life? Well, you know, I guess you get into semantics of, of what that really means. You know, uh, I was helping lead worship with, uh, for my church youth group when I was in college, you know, just trying to serve if I could. And um, so when we started Skillet, we, you know, one of my guitar player at the time was the actual worship leader for our church. And I would help serve here or there if I could, you know, but I would say in one way or the other, I've been, I've been playing music professionally for over half of my life now. Um, so yeah, I, I, I guess I'm not, I'm not 20 anymore. <laughs> It's amazing. I heard a story that when you were growing up, like rock music, which is kind of the genre which you create and, and, and give your worship, uh, wasn't even really kind of allowed in your home, and yet God kind of drew you to that. What is it about this art form and medium, which is going to be a worship that looks very different to some people's definition of what worship music should be? What drew you to that, and how do you, it's so genuine and natural to you, what is it about this music that expresses worship for you? Yeah. Wow. Great stuff. Um, it is true. I was raised that my mom was a piano teacher, um, and a voice teacher and a flute teacher. Um, and, but I never played the flute, but my mom, you know, forced me to take piano at uh, probably at age four or five started singing around that time and, and sang in church and stuff like that. My mom was a fanatical fanatical follower of Jesus and taught me about the Bible ever since I was a kid. And, um, when I first heard uh, what, what I would, I would call it not really even rock music. It was more like pop music, Michael Jackson, you know, and Prince and, and some of the eighties. First time I ever heard a contemporary song outside of church was Michael Jackson. And I came home from my friend's house and I said, mom, I heard this new music kind of music. And I sang Michael Jackson to her. And my mom gave me the holiest butt whooping of all time, man. I mean, straight up, straight up Southern Baptist whooping for that. And, you know, she, my mom, you know, bless her. She loved Jesus, but she just really believed that rock music and, and drums, drums specifically were like, the worst thing that the devil ever created in, in her mind, you know? And, and, uh, when I, I mean, I didn't listen to contemporary music after that. When I first heard rock music, I was probably in fifth or sixth grade. To me, it was always that, that the God is the creator, you, you know, the, the devil isn't the creator, the devil, he twists, he, he perverts things that God creates. And I thought, man, if this is, if God creates music and, and if God uses music as a vehicle to speak, then I don't know why he can't use rock and roll as well, you know? And so that's what drew, drew me to it. When I first got into Christian music, uh, my, my parents were not happy about it, but my mom allowed me to listen to a few Christian artists and those artists just so drastically changed my life in the way that I understood who God was. And I always thought if I got a chance to help somebody, like Petra helped me or, or Michael W. Smith helped me, then I would like to do so. Yeah, that's awesome. Some of your songs, John, they sound to me like they're about breaking free. If it's like conformity or maybe breaking free from apathy, I'm thinking about songs like Victorious or Anchor, but other songs of yours are just flat out worship songs. Uh, Stars, for example, Famous is That Way. Do you have kind of a hope that people will engage with your music, sort of come in the door of a concert one way, but leave changed in some way, just through the power and the message and the testimony in those songs? 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's a great way to say what my heart is. You know, not not every song is going to be a uh, you know a, a gospel message that deals with you know uh, and Adam and Adam in the fall all the way through justification through Christ. You know, not every song is going to be the gospel in its entirety. I view my art as a way to sing things that I hope people can relate to. Maybe a little bit like when you read the Psalms, you know, not, not every Psalm is starts off good. <laughs> Some of the Psalms start off, you know, pretty, pr- pretty raw, you know, pr- like wh- why have you left me? All of my enemies are going to get me if you don't show up God, you know? And so I like that the art can be the intimate way that you feel in your day. And uh, if people come in and listen to a concert or a skillet album, you're going to hear a progression of the art about what it is. You're going to go through the struggle. You're going to go through the tragedy, but you're also going to hear about the triumph of the cross. So for me, it's, it's about the tragedy in order to get to the triumph and, and writing those intimate songs about the way you feel Not every day with Jesus is awesome. There's going to be some hard days because Jesus himself said to pick up your cross, follow me. And, and cross bearing isn't, uh, as one of my pastor friends says, cross bearing isn't always a joy parade. <laughs> and I always like, it's for the joy, but it doesn't always feel happy. Some days are going to be hard and living for Jesus is life is hard. But um, those are the things that I like to sing about. And there is a, a bit of a form of, I think when you started the question, you didn't say something about rebellion, but I can't remember what you said, but there's that, uh, how you put it, there's that feeling of some of my songs have a tinge of rebellion. And the reason for me, like our song, Awake and Alive, that rebellion comes from a place of not wanting to follow the crowd, a, 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 a place of, it doesn't matter that my record label said, John, if you want to make it in rock music, you have to drop the Jesus stuff, you know? You, you can't talk about Jesus and be a successful rock and roll artist at the same time. And I don't want to follow the crowd. I, I would rather be unashamed of Christ and only sell a few records than to sell my soul and, and, and gain the whole world, right? So a little bit of that rebellious streak is, is that a rebellion towards God. It's a rebellion towards the things of the world. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. Dr. Powers, who is my friend, and I call him Jonathan, but I thought calling one John and one other one John 2 would be too confusing with <laughs> biblical literature. So, uh, Dr. Powers, I want to ask you about um, kind of God's expectations for his people in worship. And the scripture is clear that God wants us to worship. Uh, what kind of worship is uh, God looking for from his people? Yeah, that's a very important question. That's a great question. Um, and, um, you know, we've been talking about that really um, in many ways already. Um, uh, the kind of worship, you know, there's a lot of ways we can think about kind of worship. Uh, kind of worship is it dependent upon style of worship. Um, doesn't matter style of music or style, you know, kind of the, the feel <clears throat> or whatever. Um, so it's, it's not dependent upon style, um, of course. Um, style is a way that we communicate, that we engage, um, that we contextualize in, por- in important ways. Um, but really, the, the, the whole point of this is to delight in God. You know, to, of worship is delight in God. Um, we're seeking um, delight in our creator, delight in the one that loves us, that has shown us love first, and that we are responding to in love. And... Um, uh, as, as John was saying, that's not an, it doesn't necessarily mean it's an emotional feeling, just like, um, you know, what does it mean for me to um, care for my wife or love my wife appropriately? There's not always a, a, it's not always the fuzzy feelings and stuff, you know, that if I'm only relying on that, then that's not good. <laughs> but to say this is, this is adoration, this is love, and, and what does God want from us? It's not that he's it's not that he's sitting back and just kind of in his chair and saying, bring it, bring it, bring it, you know, um, in some strange way or, or uh, some selfish way, I guess. Um, but um, instead, God is um, saying, I want to engage with you. You know, in worship, this is us engaging with one another. I want your eyes focused on me um, because uh, my, my eyes are focused on you. And I want this to be a conversation, a dialogue. Um, I want us to, uh, to, to join in this together. And so we use things like music. Um, I, 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 an example I often use is kind of like eyeglasses. 
you know, um, eyeglasses help us see better. And so when we put on eyeglasses, we're able to see things around us. <clears throat> things like music and sermons, scripture readings, uh, different things that we employ in worship help us see God and know God. Um, as John was saying, the characteristics of God, um, the story of God, um, all of those things, we, we know God better. They help us see him. You know, we're not meant to take delight in the glasses themselves. Um, that, that does us no good. If we set the glasses down and just say, look at how amazing these glasses are. I love these glasses. Um, we're supposed to use them that we can see the things around us. And so, you know, I, that, that's what God desires in worship, that we might see him, that we might encounter him, um, that we might join in with him, um, and that through that, he wants to transform us um, and, uh, and, and lead us forth, you know, from those, uh, those times of personal worship and those times of corporate worship that would go out um, uh, more, you know, made more in the image of Christ. How do you define worship? Is it something that you could say, this is what worship is and what it isn't? How do you define it? Are you asking uh, me oh, or? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just want to make sure I didn't interrupt, interrupt somebody. You know, I, I think I've gone through lots of different shifts in my life about what that is. And if you had, had you asked me Four years ago, I probably would have quoted the scripture that says, you know, our, uh, uh, our bodies are living, living sacrifice. What does it make your body a living sacrifice? Yep. Which is wonderful. That's the word of God. So we know that's true. But I think for me, the, uh, the, the, the newest, most freshest thing that makes the most sense to me is when I am, I am enjoying God at the most, I'm valuing him the most supremely when I am having right thoughts towards him. And when I'm having right thoughts towards him, I find myself, I, I don't, it's, it's not that I feel excited. I, I am excited. I feel like I've discovered something really wonderful and that it causes that the, the, in my heart, the way that I value him more. Dr. Powers, I want to ask you, Jesus says in John four <clears throat> that God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Mm. How are Christians to understand this verse of scripture, and how is that applied to our lives? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, that uh, I get that a lot in classes. Um, you know, when people bring that verse up, say, can you unpack this for us a little bit? And, you know, with the spirit, it, it starts by saying God is spirit. And so there's a sense that um, we understand the Holy Spirit's activity here, the Holy Spirit's mm. role. In connecting us with Christ and with one another. Um, and so to worship in spirit has something to do with that, um, in a sense. Um, also understanding the context that is being, that quote comes out of, right, um, is uh, Jesus talking with the woman at the well, and they're, they're talking about the temple in Jerusalem, and this other temple, you know, Samaria, and, and what temple is it that we should worship at, and everything. And, and he's saying, um, in essence, you know, um, where the, let's just take the, the Jewish people in particular, they've been coming to the temple and that's a very prominent place of worship for them where they believe God's presence is, right? Um, if you wanted to write God a letter, it'd be one temple Mount Jerusalem and you could send it to him. Cause that's his presence was in the Holy of Holies there, you know? And so um, the sense of, of worshiping in spirit is also the sense that um, with the Holy Spirit, you know, at Pentecost and things like that coming upon us, now we're not tied to a location like the temple where um, that is the only place that we might access God and, 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 um, and, and dwell with him and um, encounter him. Um, the, the spirit's going to move in a different way now. And so um, there's that sense there as well, um, as well as just our spirits too, that there's an internal aspect here, you know, the mental, the, the heart, you know, the mind, heart, body all coming together in worship that um, with us as the new temples of the Holy Spirit, um, we are um, engaged in our whole self. In worship. And we don't ignore any of those, you know, we don't just say the mind or just the heart um, and we don't neglect the body, that the body's important too. We are embodied creatures. And so all that, that plays together. The truth part of it, I really see um, in terms of, uh, I just use the word orthodoxy. A lot of times we think of orthodoxy as, you know, right doctrine or right theology or something like that. But the root of orthodoxy, ortho and doxo, is, uh, think of like orthopedics, or orthodontics. It's, it's correct or right, you know, right, correct. Um, and doxo, think of doxology, which is glory or worship. And so we're talking about orthodoxy. We're actually talking about right worship. And what is right worship? It's the right or right glory. Let's say glorifying God rightly. How do you glorify God rightly? 
by accurately portraying who God is. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, exactly what John was saying, his character, talk about his character, sing about God, let there be a revelation of God. You know, you can't respond to something until it's been revealed to you, you know? <laughs> um, it's, it's like saying thank you before somebody's ever given you anything. You know, it's like, well, what? <laughs> so, um, so a revelation of God, you know, and saying we want to reveal God, and we want to do it correctly. We want to do it accurately, you know, from what we know in the scriptures, from what we know <clears throat> from the history of the church that's been passed down to us. Um, there's, a, there's a right glorification of God that happens in our worship, and that's how we worship in truth. Um, All right. Yeah, glorifying God rightly in the things that we say and the things that we pray and the things that we sing, the same things that we preach and all that. So I see those two things playing together in an important way. Man, that's awesome. Thank you for that answer. And um, you talked about being engaged with the worship in spirit and in truth. John, is there a time when you are uh, on the platform, you're singing a song that is glorifying to God, and it just, it just, if you feel engaged in worship, what's happening in that moment when you just feel like this is right? This just feels, you know, hard to put into words, but it just feels exactly like the right place to be. And is there times when you're in, in doing music where it just doesn't feel like it's coming together, something isn't connecting? Can you kind of compare those two? What, what's happening when it's really powerful worship and other times when it just feels like it's flat? You know, I think that worship leaders, which uh, again, is, that's not necessarily my forte, but I do know that worship leaders, that when that's what they always do, I do know that there can be a certain level of, um, uh, I was going to say, frustration. And, and I was, I was going to actually say earlier, but I, I forgot to, when you said, what's some good advice for you know, worship leaders or whatever, however you ask that. I do know that there have been people sometimes that say, honestly, I feel like I'm up here singing, and I don't feel like the people are with me. And I remember when I was in college, my, my pastor saying uh, to me, he said, John, if you're going to leave worship, you never yell at the congregation if you don't think they're getting it. <laughs> and I thought that has always stuck with me because uh, even though I don't leave worship on Sunday mornings a lot, you know, I think there are times when you're probably up there. I've experienced this before. And you like, you look out and you go, man, everybody's tired. Everybody's exhausted. They're not getting it. And I know that those kind of things happen. And so uh, I, I guess if there was an answer I would have to that, it'd be that, I don't know if they're getting it feeling. And now I have to do something incredibly awesome for them to get it. And I think that I would just encourage people that that's obviously never going to happen. <laughs> you cannot, you know, in your own strength, cause a movement of God and you cannot in your own strength, bring revelation. That's something that God does uh, as, as Jonathan was saying. So um, I, I just think that there's that feeling of, Hey, I'm doing everything that I can do to serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my strength. But it is not because of me that uh, the blessing of the Lord and whatever that may mean, meaning that everybody gets it or everybody started singing loud or this, that, or the other, that's not going to happen from you. That's going to happen from a work of God. And so there, I just always remember my pastor saying that I've always held that it's not about what you do. It's not about your good singing. And I, maybe, I'd, maybe I'd say a little bit of encouragement because I know that musicians can tend to be arrogant. Is it okay if I say that? I'm a musician. I'm a singer. We tend to be a little arrogant. And I always want to encourage people, especially in worship. I mean, what's amazing about God is that he says just with a joyful noise. So we hold to it that it doesn't matter if you know how to sing well or not. If you understand music, if you sing off key, it's not your performance that God loves. It's your heart that God loves. The flip side of that is that if you do have an amazing voice, it's not like heaven has never heard a voice like yours before, right? You're not that unique. God gave you a gift. Walk in the gift, serve people in the gift, and leave all the other rest of it to the Lord, you know? Yeah, we're talking about leading worship and our emphasis is on worship. Let's change it around for a minute. You mentioned something really interesting. Let's look at the leading for a minute. You really can't lead someone to worship if God isn't working in their heart in a way that's spiritual and mysterious. But can you create an environment or, um, I don't know, an atmosphere, a setting that's conducive that the Lord might use as a vehicle to move a heart? 
Uh, you know, I believe so. I know there's a lot of different theological implications of this, and I think some people get nervous, and I understand why. They get nervous of the implications of uh, getting an atmosphere for the Holy Spirit to move. People get really nervous about that because of what's that going to mean? Is it going to mean like, yeah, something that then becomes not about the Word of God. And um, I particularly, I'm not like that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm totally in. Let's go for it. Let's create the atmosphere. I'm not a theology professor, but I do believe that if you, I believe that me as a, as a worship leader, if I am full of the presence of God and if I lead in worship, I believe that it will, I don't mean that it will imprint on people, but it will be reproduced. And I think that what you said a second ago is a little bit like, I always say to parents, my, my kids are teenagers now, and I always say to parents when they have young kids, they go, man, your kids really love Jesus. I mean, hearing your kids pray is amazing. How does that happen? And I always say, well, here's the thing. If if you never pray in front of your kids, then they might not learn how to pray. Uh, but if, if you tell them, go pray, son, but they never hear you do it, uh, it, it's very hard to lead when you don't lead by example. So I do believe by our example that we can create an atmosphere for God to do something. Now, now God doing something is going to be his work, all of his glory. It's all dependent on him either way. But can we do our parts in order to create an atmosphere of jubilee for the saints to praise the Lord. Yes, we can. Can we do so something to create an atmosphere of right thinking, as John just said, right worship to God about who he is? Of course we can create, you know, that atmosphere. But of course it's not in our strength. We all know that. It's all up to him. But I believe that we can create those times for God to do a great, a great move. That's awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Dr. Powers, I want to ask you about one other verse of scripture that John referenced earlier. It's from Romans 12, verse 1. Paul, writing to the church at Rome, says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. How do believers offer their body as a living sacrifice? That, um, that's such an important passage, especially in the book of Romans. It's, uh, it's really a pivot point, kind of a hinge point in the book of Romans. As you see, um, you know, it starts with the word therefore, and, which means something before is very important. Um, and, and Paul spends these 11 chapters talking about the mercies of God, right? Um, I, I, I urge you, therefore, in view of God's mercies. Um, and what is that? You know, all the work of Jesus Christ that he has done. And, um, you know, this is, this is what we've been talking about here. Um, when, we're, when we're talking about worship, giving ourselves over to God, um, saying that we are a vessel you know, of the Holy Spirit, and we are, we are, um, we are, we are just, yeah, carrying our cross, as was said, you know, um, that, that we, are, we are making our sacrifice to God of ourselves. Um, it's because of what God has done for us, you know, that, and, and who God is. It's not just what he's done, um, where we make him only utilitarian, but that, um, who God is and what he has done, um, has shaped our lives so much that we are giving ourselves over in, in all of these things then that Paul has said that Jesus has done for us. Um, that while we are yet sinners, that Christ died for us. This is how we know God's love for us, that we do not need to fear condemnation. You know, those who are in Christ Jesus, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. He spent all this time developing this. And then we come to this, um, this passage that um, we are to give ourselves as living sacrifices. But then it's interesting what comes after it is humility, um, which we were just talking about, <laughs> humility. Um, so do not think of yourself more highly than you ought and love one another. And then do not be a stumbling block for others um, and care for those within your community. And so, um, so one of the, the ways that we um, give ourselves over is the, the ways that we give ourselves over to one another as well, not just to, um, not where it's just a me and God thing, but, but Paul's painting a picture of the church here and saying that we are connected to one another and that um, mm. the ways that we use our lives as a living sacrifice is the way that we sacrifice ourselves for one another. And what's interesting in that, that um, passage, when it says your spiritual act of worship, depending on the translation, you know, for this is your spiritual act of worship, the, um, 
uh, the Greek there um, would be liturgia, uh, some clinch of that, liturgia, which is where we get the word liturgy. So he says, this is your liturgy. Um, your, your true liturgy is the way that you care for one another, the way that you love one another, the way that you act as the church, the way that you are, you, you are becoming the church and function as the mm-hmm. church. And it's, uh, it's, it's a great reminder to us, actually, um, something beautiful um, that, that, that we know. And the word liturgy um, simply means work of the people. Um, that, that's, that's what it means. And so um, that is our work that we do. Um, in glorifying God, in, in loving one another, caring for one another. And so you find in the prophets, you know, all over the place, why is it that God rejects worship? To go back to the beginning, what is it that God wants in worship, <clears throat> God rejects in worship on the other side of it? And he says, um, you're not caring for the widow and the orphan and the, the alien. Um, you're, not, um, you're not living the lifestyles that I've asked you to live. You're not going forth from these times. Well, that these things are bad, but you're not going forth from them transformed people um, bearing my image to the world. And if you're going to walk away just having a good experience, I don't care about that. I, I, I reject that. Um, mm. What I want to see is this. Um, so, you know, Amos, my and, and the prophets alive. And so uh, that's part of that living sacrifice too, that our bodies being used in that way um, as the church, um, what God desires, the work of the people. Awesome. Thank you for that as well. As I said, always empowered by the Holy Spirit. You know, this is not our own work. It is so important to clarify. Don't forget the Holy Spirit, please. (laughs) Well, gentlemen, our conversation, our time is coming to a close. We have time for one last question. And so, John, I got to say thank you so much for being here. I love to hear your point of view, your enthusiasm, your love for the Lord, and I love to hear your music as well. We just ask you as a final parting question, uh, hypothetical, you're teaching a class in worship, uh, what are the, what are some of the lessons? What are the lessons that you would say these are the ones that you guys should know? Oh man, would this be practical application? I, I probably is that what you mean? Maybe practical and also some of the spiritual. Some of the spiritual. Well, I, I probably would the the things that have already been mentioned probably about right thinking towards God because I think there's a, a great implication of that. Um, and uh, uh, when when Moses comes down from Mount Sinai after he's heard the voice of the Lord and the people have already begun to add worship of Baal to their their worship of God. I mean, while he was up there talking to God. Right. And it's an important thing to see about this is what we do when we add things to him that are not of him. We are we are idolaters. We are adulterers. That's what this means. So it would be the importance of, of right uh, thoughts about God in the songs that we do sing to him. If you're, if you're in charge of choosing the songs that you sing uh, on a worship team, these things should, should enter our mind. And I also think that I would probably give some, some really good, uh, I, I have to think of a Bible story, which I, I can't think of right now, but I would find a good Bible reference for teaching us as, as leaders of worship, a, uh, of the dangers of um, uh, of arrogance and the dangers of of uh, stealing little pieces of that worship and keeping it for ourselves, you know, is that is that a little bit like what Lucifer did? You know, I, I don't know. I'd have to really study this a little bit. But if you are the one that is in charge of funneling all of the saints' worship, funneling it up to God as the you know the representative, if you will then there's a pretty big implication that you don't steal some of that glory for yourself or I'm, I'm the one with the great voice. Good job today. Good job choosing the whatever people look to me cause I'm beautiful and I'm on stage, all that. I think it's great for us to empty ourselves out of ourselves and, and realize that, that God's given you and an, a great gift to lead and to remind yourself that it is not about you. So I'd have to find a really good Bible reference for that, but that would be the lesson for all of us arrogant musicians. Yeah, God gave us a gift and, you know, bless God for the gift and, and be humble, man. Walk, walk humbly. Well, we, we can appreciate your imperfections because we carry many, those of us who aren't worship leaders, we carry many of those ourselves. So we love you guys anyway. Yes. Say thanks so much for sharing some of your time so generously with us today here at Asbury. God bless. I loved it. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. Okay, bye.